start this. Uh, I'm gonna add a page here. Oops. Oh, it's so like didn't need to have this in the recording, I guess. There. <laughs> okay, now I'm ready. Are you ready? Post Halloween ready? Now you have to wait a whole year. I guess it was worse when we were when we were younger. Some of us are younger than others. Um, we were supposed to rip through and get into chapter six, but uh, I'm giving myself permission to just go nice and slow through chapter five because it is very important that we build a, a nice kind of foundation, foundations of inference uh, for us to work off of. So I'm just going to give myself that. And let's do a little bit of review. A little bit, a lot of it. Uh, okay, so we talked about confidence intervals. That's done. I'm not going to review that because we've done that for the past two or three days even. But what I do want to review is hypothesis testing. So hypothesis testing is when we formally test uh, some sort of hypothesis, so some idea about the population. So this is how we, we formally test a hypothesis, which is, is just an idea about a population, about a population should I go there? Population parameter, because that's what we're interested in statistics. But it's a little bit redundant. Why? Because a parameter can only be from a population, right? And so maybe I'll put the population in brackets, right? Maybe I have some idea about a parameter that I want to test, okay? Um, common example, I deserve a raise because I bring in significantly more money than my coworkers. How do you prove that, right? We need some sort of way to say significantly more because, and that's what we're getting to, right? That's numerical data, but it, it's something that's tangible at least. Um, my The proportion of sales that I make is significantly higher than my coworkers. <gasps> Zoom, letting me down again. Oh, uh, let me just try to sort this out. Uh, okay. It's still recording. Whereas this morning it completely clunked out, wouldn't let me back on. So it's better, I guess. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, so we want some way to be able to say that, okay, the proportion of sales that I make is significantly more than my coworkers, right? So give me the money, that kind of deal. Okay, so you have some idea about your coworkers' proportions. Uh-oh, I feel like I did something besides just zoom in a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna check on it, just sorry. Sorry. Okay, all good. Okay, so hypothesis testing. Oh, thank you, sorry. Need to set up a, a desk, a special desk. Someone will be on door duty. I know, right? And there usually is like an obsolete ruler or something. Maybe a rope. Yeah. 
I'll uh, I'll get you one of these internet cables. <laughs> so we're gonna do hypothesis testing. Like I said, it's it's very formal. So whenever you want to prove something, okay, uh, you have to do a, a formal hypothesis test. So we are going to follow four, or I'm gonna follow four steps. I encourage you to do the same. And so hypothesis testing is going to be, I guess, we haven't talked about checking the conditions. No, let's pretend that we're not going to for a little bit longer. It's better that way, it's more fun that way. Uh, step one is to state your hypotheses, right? And so state the hypotheses for one sample proportion. Now, how these questions are gonna go on the final exam, for example, you're gonna have a bunch of different questions. Oh, oh, oh that's so surprising, Emily. Uh, no, that's not surprising. But the hard part is going to be to read all those questions and figure out what type of question it is, okay? We've only introduced the one type of question so far, okay? So before you even do step one, you need to figure out, figure out what type of question it is. For us, we've only talked about one sample proportions. So, so far, we only have that to choose from. And what that's going to do, and the reason that I emphasize how important it is to figure out what type of question you have, is because once you've landed on a question type, uh, where's your formula sheet? Then you're stuck in that section of your formula sheet, and there's nowhere else to go. If you've told me it's one sample proportion, you're not looking at two sample proportions, you're not doing a chi-squared, you're not doing a means question, so all of those are out, okay? And so I'm gonna grab this chunk from the formula sheet so that we have it, okay? because figuring out what type of question it is points you to the right place on the formula sheet, okay? And I, I know it doesn't feel like it, but I'm really trying to guide you in the right direction on the formula sheet. I know it doesn't feel like that. Um, things like, the sampling distribution of p hat. That's you can ignore that if you want. It's true, but we don't use it for anything really. But then I gave you the confidence interval for p. Remember the interval we're trying to capture the population proportion, which is p. And so we we do this, do a little boop boop boop, uh, and then now here we're hypothesis testing for p. Right, so we're trying to figure out what the population proportion looks like and our null hypothesis, right, which is our step one, state the hypothesis, hypotheses. I only give you the null hypothesis, why? Because the alternative is going to be the same except you change the sign, right? And so the sign is anything but equal to because that's already taken. So in step one, state the hypotheses, once you've decided that this is a one sample proportion question, then the hypotheses or the null hypothesis is on the formula sheet, right? And so your null hypothesis is, so it's an H subscript zero, your null hypothesis, and it's a statement, so just a, a colon, it's a statement about the population param or yeah, the parameter, which in our case is the population proportion. And so P is equal to some P naught. 
Now this P naught is going to be a value that you want to test your sample proportion against, right? So this is going to be a value from the question. Yeah? This is a value from the question. Yeah? It's going to be a proportion. And so the P naught is just the placeholder for some number, right? Is it less than 40%, then it would be 0.4, right? But this, well, I guess all of this, that's always gonna be your null hypothesis for a one sample proportion question, okay? And you can get fancy with the, the equal sign, but for us, we're just starting. So I, I like to just only do an equal sign in the null hypothesis, okay? Uh, and it'll always have equality, okay? And the idea is you have to assume that P is equal to whatever you want to kind of disprove until you have proof otherwise. Okay. So then the alternative hypothesis, we have a couple of options, P not equal to P not, noticing that of course, right, I can't state my null hypothesis about uh, 0.4 and then all of a sudden be drawing conclusions about 0.6, that just doesn't make sense, right? Um, has to be about the population proportion. So those values, once you've decided here, you just drag them, drag and drop, right, into your alternative hypothesis. The only thing that changes here is this sign, right? And so the sign, depends on the question, and I know that's annoying. This is what we call a two-sided test. Because I, I'm concerned about either direction, right, from P naught. Or the alternative is that P is less than P naught. Now, this is where we could get fancy. And if I have a less than here, what could my null hypothesis be? It could be greater than or equal to, but I just ignore the greater than and that's fine. You're allowed to do that as well. But this is what we call a one-sided test. Do you remember when, when the one-sided versus two-sided came up? It wasn't until step three when we need to find the p-value, right? The area in the tail we need to figure out which tail we want to go into. So then we go all the way back to step one to figure out which tail it is we're interested in. Okay. And it's going to be the tail that matches the alternative hypothesis. Okay. Or the other way would be the alternative hypothesis is that P is greater than P naught, which again is, is a one-sided test. <clears throat> arguably one of the hardest things to do for hypothesis testing, besides just remembering all the steps that you have to do, right? But reading a question and figuring out what the null and alternative hypotheses are, that's, that's really hard, okay? But once that's done, you're ready for step two. Step two, I call it do the test because it sounds cooler. Do the do. Uh, do the test. Or if you want to be boring, calculate the test statistic. It's proper. Okay. So again, on your formula sheet, I'll give you the null hypothesis for the hypothesis test followed by the test statistic that you are supposed to calculate, okay? And so here, I uh, need a color I haven't used yet here. I always use pink, but whatever. 
So in our case, the test statistic that we're going to calculate is Z equal to P hat minus P naught. So that's where the P naught from the null hypothesis comes into play and why it's important to have the right value, right? Divided by the standard error, which we now calculate using P naught Q naught over N instead of P hat Q hat, subtle, subtle change. Okay. What's this doing? Z scores are always just finding, okay, how far is P hat from P naught? Okay. Taking into account the spread, right? The standard error of P hat in this case. Okay. And I'm seeing that this is a little hard to read, so I'm gonna just clarify that there. And this is, I'll say the value from H naught is that P is equal to P naught. So all the way throughout, we do all this testing, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, right? We assume that this distribution is centered on P naught until we have proof otherwise. Okay. And so once you have your Z score, right? You could talk about Z scores if the Z is, is more than two standard errors away, right? Then you know that, okay, this P hat, this sample proportion that I saw is, is quite far from P naught, from my hypothesized value, right? So far, in fact, that it's kind of evidence against my null hypothesis, right? And so, but we're doing a formal hypothesis test, which means that instead of talking about how many standard errors away my P hat was from P naught, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert it to a probability, which we call a p-value. So step three is find the p-value. It doesn't hurt to define the p-value again, or maybe it does. No. Remember the p-value is the probability. So right away when I say probability, you're think you've seen a Z, so then you're thinking, oh, it's an area under the curve, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got it, Emily. Uh, right? Area under the curve. So it's the probability of seeing something as extreme or more extreme of seeing something as extreme or more extreme than what we saw in our sample. Assuming H naught is true. So assuming the null hypothesis is true. Oops, true. Can't write at all today. I'm gonna add a page here. So this is where we need to go back and look at the alternative hypothesis, right? So the probability is the area under the curve of seeing something as extreme or more extreme, which tells me it's an area in the tail, area in the tail, so potentially tails than what we saw in 
our sample, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So from the alternative hypothesis, we had three options, right? And so uh, let's see here. If HA was that, and let's start with an easy one, less than P naught. We assume the null hypothesis is true, which says that P is equal to P naught. What does that mean in terms of a graph? Oh, there she goes again with those graphs, huh? I know. But if we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true, then the null hypothesis is that P is equal to P naught, which means that the center must be at P naught. That's what we're assuming is true. Yeah. Now, there's a little bit of common sense that goes into this. If you want to show that P is actually less than this value, your sample proportion better be less than the, the population proportion. So then here, you would have a P hat down here. Okay. So the P value, this is your one sided P value. That's important because you know how to find a Z score, you know how to use the Z table, but if you can't make the connection between the alternative hypothesis and the area that you need to find, it's gonna be really difficult, right? Generally, it's just the area in the tail, right? From whatever, whatever side you're on, right? Because what's the Z score finding? It's finding how far is this P hat from P naught, and if it's really far away, how does that translate into the probability? It means it's a really small probability, right? So then that leads us into the conclusion, okay? But we're not there yet. Where we are is here. The, what if the alternative is P is greater than P naught? Same idea. You've got a distribution centered on P naught, and now you've got some P hat that's greater than P naught, and you wanna show that it's proof against the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis, right? So this is still a one-sided P value. Where it gets a little bit weird is for the two-sided p-value. Okay, so here, if the alternative is p is not equal to p naught, make that not equal to ugh, there. Your p hat is only going to be in one of the tails. But what we do is we we just find the area of the one tail. And then we multiply it by two and pretend that it could have happened in the other direction as well, right? Because I just want to know, is it not equal to, yeah. which is going to look like this. So still centered on P naught. And let's say I have a P hat up here. Then this is still my one-sided P value. And then your two-sided p-value, which is what you want, right? You want to replicate and pretend that it could have just as well happened in the other direction, right? And so the two-sided p-value is the one-sided p-value times two, you replicate the area in the opposite tail. OK. 
Okay. Tricky. But you know how to do all the components separately. Now we're just smushing them together into one big, big thing. Okay. And so what color have I been using? Step four is your conclusion. Now, your conclusion is going to come from the p-value. Okay? And so, and this is where I can, I guess we introduced it a little bit, but I would, I would call it kind of the end of the review around here-ish, right? Start fresh. That was all review. It was, but it's all important. So it doesn't hurt to hear it again. I'll do a little little pseudo end of review because we talked about uh, some things past this, but not that I really expect you to remember. <laughs> okay, so your conclusion is going to have three parts. Okay. What was the overall thing that we said? We said, okay, if the p-value is small enough, right? then you have enough evidence to reject H naught. Okay, so if the p-value is small enough, and we did introduce, right, kind of a rule for small enough, but generally if it's small enough, right, I, we said if it's less than the alpha level and alpha is 0 0.05 by default. So if the p-value is less than 0 0.05 is the, the default. If the p-value is small enough, we have enough evidence to reject H naught. And if we're rejecting it, I'll just say in brackets in favor of HA, because it's our only alternative, right? It's what we outlined as our alternative in the beginning. But the reason I put it in brackets is because I, I don't want you to get hung up on the HA. In fact, I'm happy if you just talk about H naught, why is that? Our conclusion has to be about H naught because we did all our testing assuming H naught was true. Okay. So the conclusion, and this is important, well, everything's important in this, in this section. Uh, but here, our conclusion must be in terms of H naught because we did all our testing assuming H naught was true. Because we did all our testing assuming H naught was true. The converse of this, right? If the p-value is small enough, so less than 0.05, then we have enough evidence to reject H naught. The flip side of that would be if the p-value is not less than 0.05, then you do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. Right, and so the two scenarios and the only two scenarios are these. If the p-value is less than 0.05 or generically the alpha level, which can change, but usually I just leave it at 0.05 or I just leave it blank and you're supposed to remember that the default is 0.05, right? So if the p-value is less than 
then you have enough evidence to reject H naught. I guess I could do like an arrow or something cute. Or if the p value is greater than 0 0.05, then you do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. Then you do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. And this is where I understand that it's tempting to say something like, we accept H naught, but there's still a p-value chance that I'm wrong, right? No matter how small, you never want to commit to something where you, there's some probability that you're wrong, right? And so, so this is where uh, stats and uh, it becomes this kind of dance between English and logic and math. And, uh, and we have to do this very intricate dance, okay? And so you can't say something like, oh, I, I accept this hypothesis because there's always some probability that you're wrong. Why? Because the, the tails of the Z distribution, we know they go to infinity and negative infinity, right? In theory. And so there's always some probability of the, this extreme thing happening, right? And so that's why you can never commit to anything completely, but you can say, well, the probability of that happening, if the, the null hypothesis is true, it, it's too small. I, I just, I can't go there. It's more likely that the alternative hypothesis is true. And so I have enough evidence to reject H naught. And maybe I'll add that here. We have enough evidence to reject H naught. So you either do have enough evidence or you do not have enough evidence. Yeah. Remembering that the p-value is just a reflection of how close your sample proportion was to your hypothesized proportion, right? So if this area all of a sudden was looking like this, so P naught is here and your P hat was here, right? And so now you have some very large P value, right? Then that's when you say, well, I don't have enough evidence to reject H naught. Right, because these two things are relatively close together, right? So there's going to be uh, some distance, two standard errors probably, right, from before, right, where we're allowing things to be relatively different, right, until the area in the tail becomes so small, right, usually around two standard errors away, so a Z of plus minus two, uh, then we start to say, oh, unlikely th that that would happen just by chance alone. Okay. And so there, and that's, that's the tricky part is kind of wrapping your head around, okay, there's some region where we're saying they're close enough. Right. But if I, if I'm doing something like this, what do I choose? The desk. Okay. So here I could be right at the desk. Where's Emily? Oh, she's over there by the desk. Yeah, everyone's committed, right? And so I can take a step back. Where's Emily? Oh, she's over there by the desk. Sort of, close enough, right? And then, so then I step away a little bit more. Oh, where's Emily? Oh, she's over there by the desk? Whiteboard? Something like that, right? And so there's this there's this region where, okay, it's over there by, by the hypothesized value, that's all fine. But then as you move further and further away, right, you start to doubt your null hypothesis because this was supposed to happen just by random chance alone. It can, but it's unlikely. Okay. And then I had my, I won't try to copy it in because it was totally not working last day 
but I'll bring it up again. Because I, well, one, I think it's really funny and helpful. Where is it? The P is low, then the null hypothesis must go. It's just got that ring to it, you know? Okay. And it wouldn't let me copy it in before, but I got it in. Okay. So that's from last day. So your conclusion then is going to be three parts, which means I'm going to make it out of three marks on a test, right? So that's that's a lot of marks. So you want to make sure that you cover all, all the bases. So the conclusion has three parts. So it's one of four parts, but then it has three parts. I know that's rude, but... The first part is you're going to compare your p-value to the alpha level. Since my p-value of 0 0.015, for example, is less than 0.05, right? so you just articulate how your p-value compares to the alpha level. Okay, so you're going to compare the p-value to the alpha level is it less than is it greater than 0.05 right and you're just going to say it in words and this is where a lot of people you just say the p value but i want you to to really take some time and articulate what the p value is okay and once you've done that, right, because the p-value is less than my alpha level, then I have enough evidence to reject H0. So then you're going to state your conclusion in terms of H0. I have enough evidence to reject H0, or I do not have enough evidence to reject H0. And those are my only two options. I don't want to see you get fancy here. Those are your only options. Okay. And then finally, we haven't talked about anything else, I know. But there was initially a problem that we're trying to answer, some question, some research question that we're trying to answer. So then whether I reject H0 or I fail to reject H0, that means something in terms of my research question, right? So then most importantly, arguably most importantly, is your conclusion in terms of the question, right? Therefore, P is significantly less than 0.4, for example, right? or the population proportion of adults who feel a certain way is less than, significantly less than 0.4, something like that. This conclusion, just like for confidence intervals, when you have to interpret the confidence intervals, you're just gonna reword the question as an answer. It's not gonna be beautiful always, but it'll work. Yeah. Okay. I don't remember, we haven't seen an example. We're just laying out all the rules. So I'm a gamer in the sense that I love to play board games. I know, uh, cute, right? Uh, I'm not a, not a gamer gamer, but I do love playing board games. And so, uh, but you can't play the game until you know the rules. And this is like the ultimate game with a ton of rules. It's like one of those like multi-book rules. Anyways, but once you have them, you can play the game and you can play any game. Huh? All right. We talked about decision errors and I think I left you with, or I know I left you with a little problem to think about and work through. So we talked about decision errors. We already established that, okay, there's there's some p-value probability that I'm wrong if I reject H naught, right? And so 
or options are if the population, so the population exists and once I have looked at the entire population, which I never do, H naught is either true or HA is true, right? One of those two things are true. And so if H naught is true, then if I fail to reject H naught, then that's, that's a good decision, right? Whereas if I reject H naught when I shouldn't have, that's what we call a type one error. And if I, if HA is true and I don't have enough evidence to reject H naught, which usually only happens if my sample size isn't big enough, right? I wasn't able to see that activity. Um, then we call that a type two error. If I reject H naught, then that's, that's a good decision that I've made. Right? The problem is we never know which error we're making but we have to be upfront about there's there's a possibility that I'm making these either of these two errors all the time. Okay. So type one is rejecting the null hypothesis when H naught is true. So what we do is the alpha level is a predetermined probability that I'm okay with making a type one error. I'm okay with making a type one error 5% of the time, right? I don't know that I am, right? And so the probability of a type one error is the alpha level. Now the type two error is a little bit more complicated and we, we don't care about it as much, okay? Failing to reject the null hypothesis is just saying that two things are the same when they're not really, okay? Um, so it's not as big of a deal. So how we usually introduce this idea is uh, in a trial situation. So if you have a trial, then your null hypothesis would be that the defendant is innocent, right? There's nothing happened, okay? The, the equal sign is in there, right? And the alternative is that they're guilty. You found enough evidence to prove that this defendant is guilty, right? So if you're saying that this defendant is innocent, which means you don't have enough evidence to reject H naught, when they're actually guilty, right? Going back here. So you don't have enough evidence to reject H naught, but you should have makes a type two error. Yeah? In fact, whenever you fail to reject H naught, the only error that you could be making is a type two error, right? Whenever you're rejecting H naught, the only error that you could be making is a type one error. Yeah. So type one error is declaring the defendant guilty when they're actually innocent. That's really bad, right? And so, Typically, the worst error to make, right, is the type one error, right? You don't wanna say that something happened when it actually didn't, right? And so uh, typically, not, not in every single scenario, but typically a type one error is worse. Okay. Type one being rejecting H naught when I shouldn't have. <clears throat> so we said, okay, the type one error rate is the significance level 0.05. So alpha, the critical value, or the critical level of 0.05. So what that translates to is where H naught is actually true, we don't wanna incorrectly reject it more than 5% of the time. Right? We're okay with 5% of the time. When's, when's a time when you might wanna reduce that to maybe 1% if, Rejecting H naught is going to cost you a lot of money. 
yes, you need to replace all this machinery and you need to move locations and you need to do all these things. You want to think long and hard about recommending that, right? And so then you want to be really, really sure that it's going to be worthwhile, right? And so um, where is it? Um, we lower the alpha level if rejecting H naught is gonna be very costly. And that can be in terms of money or time or whatever, right? And so we lower the alpha level if rejecting H naught um, in error, right, when we shouldn't have, is very costly. Right, in terms of time or money or resources or whatever, right? You don't want to bring a drug, well, maybe you do, but uh, to make money, but uh, you don't want to bring a, a drug to market until you're sure that it's actually going to do something, right? Um, uh -huh. Okay. Finally, how about an example? Are you ready? Okay. So we talked about those Facebook interest categories and we had a survey where we asked 850 respondents. So right away, I know that N is 850. How comfortable they are with Facebook creating a list of categories for them. Do you want me to create categories? Sure. 41% of the respondents said that they are comfortable with that. And what we want to know is, do these data provide convincing evidence? And just as a keyword, as soon as you see evidence, I want your brain to go, oh, no, this is a full-blown hypothesis test. Right? And so, okay, ah. Or maybe I don't want you to go, oh no, but I want your brain to go, oh, that's a lot of work. This means that you're gonna do a hypothesis test. All the steps, formal hypothesis testing. <clears throat> do these data provide convincing evidence that the proportion of American Facebook users, so that's our entire population, right? Population proportion, are comfortable with Facebook creating a list of interest categories for them is different from 50%. Okay. Just gonna underline that 50% and the different just for a little bit. Okay. Okay, we have the 41%. 41% is a proportion. And it has to be a sample proportion, right? Because 41% of the respondents, right? Not of the entire American Facebook population, right? And so here, this 41% of the respondents tells me that P hat is 0.41. Ah, what was the first thing, or one of the first things we introduced, or I, as a selling feature for these one sample proportion problems is that you really need very little information to answer the question, right? You need either a P hat or a number of successes, which we have P hat, so that's good. You need N and you need some hypothesized proportion, right? the value that you want to compare your 0.41 to, which is where this point 0.5 comes in, right? 41%, is it significantly different from 0.5 or 50%? Okay. We're ready. Let's list what we're given first. 
given n is 850, p hat is 0. 0.41, and I'm going to throw it in right away. p naught is going to be 0. 0.5, right? Initially, a little bit confusing, right? Because I said, well, here, p is equal to 0. 0.5. But then I said p naught is equal to 0. 0.5. Ah, why? Well, your null hypothesis is that p is equal to p naught. Da -da -da. P is equal to 0. 0.5 means that p naught must be 0. 0.5. Kind of sneaky, right? But that's where that value comes in because we need that in our calculations, right? So really what we're trying to find is how far is 0. 0.41 from 0. 0.5, okay? And now we're ready. Be stretched. Let's do this thing. Step one, state your hypotheses. And you don't need to outline the steps. I do because I'm trying to show you that we do the same thing every single time. But if you have outgrown listing the steps, that's totally fine. State the hypotheses. Like I said, one of the hardest parts of hypothesis testing is figuring out what your null and alternative hypotheses are. So my null hypothesis, it's tough because we don't have any other types of questions to compare it to. So, so far, I guess I could talk myself into it being a one sample proportion question in the way that I have one sample of 850 and I have the proportion from that sample. So it's a one sample proportion question. That's going to become more obvious once we introduce two sample proportions, right? Then you're going to be able to differentiate the two. Uh, but that would be your first thing is figuring out what type of question it is. Then we can state your hypotheses, which in this case is going to be um, P is equal to 0.5, which means that P naught is 0.5. And I only make a note of that because we'll need it in a bit. So we assume that the population proportion is 0.5. We just happen to see 0.41. Is it really far away? Then that's evidence against the 0.5. But until then, we assume that that's true. The alternative hypothesis has to be about P, otherwise it doesn't make sense. P is, and this is where the different, right? You wanna know if it's less than, greater than, or not equal to. As soon as you see, okay, I wanna prove that it's different from something, that can go in either direction, right? Just not equal to 0.5. And so the different tells me, that my alternative hypothesis has to be that P is not equal to 0. 0.5. Okay, good. Let me add a page here. We might need a few pages. Okay. I'm gonna make a, a quick side note that this is where we check the conditions. Now I haven't talked about the conditions yet uh, and I'm avoiding it because I don't wanna bog you down in our first example, but this is where we would, I'll do it in a, in a subtle purple, check the conditions. Check the conditions for inference. I'll put in brackets that we haven't introduced that yet, and I'm going to parking lot it for a little bit longer. Not introduced yet.
but we can talk about and think about what those conditions might be. I'm gonna calculate a Z and use the Z table to find probabilities. And so one of the things that we had to check in order to be able to do that was that I have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures, right? And so that's one of the conditions that I need to check. I also have to have a random sample because my sample has to be representative of the population, right? And so there, there are conditions that we need to check, but um, they're not something that I'm, yeah, too obsessed with, if that makes sense. It's more important that you get the idea because the conditions will always check out. Right, and so it's just a matter of jumping through the hoops and saying, this is satisfied, this is satisfied, this is satisfied, and then uh, you go and do the test, right? And so for us, it'll always be satisfied, so that's why we're ignoring it for a little bit. Step two, do the test, or calculate the test statistic. So this is where we calculate our Z. Right, Z, and that's from your formula sheet. You can let the formula sheet be your guide as long as you can identify the type of question, then you're, you're on rails. P hat minus P naught over the square root of P naught Q naught over N. I have P hat 0. 0.41, how far is it from 0. 0.5? And now the spread just changes just slightly from the confidence interval. And that's why we needed to make a note of what P naught was, right? So here, recall that P naught was 0.5, which means that Q naught is one minus 0.5, which is also 0.5. That's nice. And now we're ready. Z is 0.41. Now it's just a matter of plug and chuck, right? And so 0.41 minus 0.5. I like to throw a zero on there. Just makes it look nicer, you know, same number of decimal places. Over the square root of 0.5 times 0.5 divided by n, which was 850. Okay. I don't have it pre-baked, so I'll, I'll bake it now. 0 0.41 minus 0 0.5, let's start there negative 0 0.09 divided by 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 divided by 850. And then don't forget that square root, roughly 0 0.01715, roughly. I'm gonna keep all my decimal places on my calculator. 0 0.09 divided by that. Woo, negative five, unless I did something wrong. Negative 5.24786-ish. Is that what you guys got? Nice. Thank you. Phew. Okay. Z. To use the Z table, we round to two decimal places because we have to match the Z table. And so Z is negative 5.25 to two decimal places. You already know, you've worked with the Z table enough to know that this is off the charts, right? And so I'll leave it at Z here and head straight into step three. Find the P value. Remembering your alternative, yep. Uh, recall the alternative hypothesis was that P is not equal to 0.5. Wait, 
here. If we wanted to sketch it out just as a guide to what we're trying to find, then that might look some, or it would look something like this. Point 0.5 in the middle, because we're assuming that that's true, right? Here, we already sense, because a Z is a point 0.5 or a 5 or negative 5 is very far away, right? So I already know that I'm going to be rejecting H0 because it's more than two standard errors away, right? But we need that formal, formal part. So then we had a p hat of 0.41. I'm drawing it so I can see it, but it's actually quite far out in the tail, right? Let's see if I can, can I snag just what I want? It's actually like this, right? Far out into the tail by that negative five point whatever. But let's do there. That's a nice compromise. And then these tails, they just keep going and going. I'll even do a little arrow to indicate that it keeps going to infinity or negative infinity. So we can find this area. This area is the one-sided p-value. But this is where we have to refer back to the alternative hypothesis. And we have to say, well, uh, I didn't want just one side. I'm concerned with it happening in the other tail as well. Okay. So here, right, we need to find, we need to replicate the area from one tail in the other tail as well. Okay. But I don't need to do any work, right? I just need to find by symmetry, I just need to find this area and then I just plaster it onto the other side, right? And I say, well, that, that distance could have happened on the other side as well, right? Up five point whatever, uh, 5.25 standard errors could have just as easily happened. So now the one-sided p-value, and I'm gonna articulate it using the Z table and you don't have to, you can use probability notation, which I'll follow it up with, but you have to do one of the two. Okay. Using the Z table, we find the area to the left of Z equal to negative 5.25. We had two options, right? You could say it's less than 0 0.0002, three zeros in there from the table, right? So I'll do that is less than 0 0.0002. Or if you want to, you could just say, well, it's, it's off the charts. I'm gonna say approximately zero. As long as you say approximately, you're safe. Okay, so here, or approximately zero. Where did this point zero 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 two come from? Negative three point four nine, right? That's the last or the the largest largest smallest value, the smallest value on your t table, right? And then it just says, well, after that, who cares? It's really small, right? You don't need to get more specific than that. So, or you could write, or right, the probability that Z is less than or equal to negative 5.25 is less than 0 0.002. If you didn't want to write that sentence. One of the things that I haven't really brought up, because I didn't see, I didn't see a, a disturbing amount of it, 
but often, and I know what you mean, but you're not saying what you mean. Often on tests, I see stuff like negative 5.25 equals 0 0.0002. That's never true. I know what you mean. I know what you're trying to say, but I don't want to see it. Really? No, that's not true. That's never true. I get it. Okay. But you want to, you want to train yourself to be writing it properly. So whether that's using words, just articulate what you're doing, that's totally fine. Or you can write it using probability notation. The probability that Z is less than or equal to negative 5.25 is less than 0 0.0002. Maybe one inch. I maybe added a zero, I don't know. Or I shouldn't scratch it all out. But do not write this. Right. And my my beef is with that equal sign. Because it's not true. You don't want to say things that are not true. Okay. Even if I multiply 0 0.0002 by 2, which I, I'm going to do, because why? I wanted to replicate this tiny area in the other tail as well. So then the two-sided p-value is just less than 0 0.0004. And to fit it all on one page, I'm just gonna bump it up, bump it up. Therefore, the two-sided p-value is less than 0 0.0004, right? Which is just 0 0.0002 times two is 0 0.004. It's a lot of work, right? But with practice, you're gonna be really, really good. Okay. That's not the end. That was only step three of a four point process. And step four has three parts, so yikes. But now we're ready. Step four is your conclusion. Ready to show me what you got? First, you're going to compare the p-value to the alpha level. Now, we, did, we weren't given an alpha level. The default alpha level is 0.05. Okay? And... One of the main things that I want to instill in you is just stating everything that you're assuming, everything that you're thinking, everything that you're doing. I know. Um, so it would go something like this. Since the two-sided p-value Just something like saying two-sided seems like it's extra, right? But it's not. Well, it is, but um, you're just articulating that you knew to find a two-sided p-value, okay? Since the two-sided p-value is less than 0 0.0004, which is why we had to do all that practice with the Z scores and finding areas under the curve and just in general being good at finding p-values, right? Is less than 0 0.0004. It is less than, that's less than 0.05, right? And the 0.05 is my assumed alpha level. It wasn't given, so I'm assuming that it's 0.05. It is less than, the assumed alpha level of 0 0.05. That's step one or part one of my conclusion, right? Comparing my, my p-value to my alpha level. And so a couple of things I'm showing off that I knew to find a two-sided p-value. 
This is also safeguarding marks if you only found a one-sided p-value, but you knew that you should have found a two-sided. And then if you tell me that the two-sided p-value is whatever you found, well, I can't fault you for that. You told me that that's what it is. Okay, fine. And then how it compares to the alpha level, which you're assuming is 0.05. So again, you dish it out, right? You say, I'm assuming that this is my alpha level. <clears throat> And I wish I could remember what colors I used. I think it was like this. So this is part one. This means, or therefore, my P, if the P is low, then the null hypothesis must go, right? And our conclusion has to be in terms of the null hypothesis. So therefore we have enough evidence to reject H naught. If I'm rejecting it, it's just good to say in favor of what? Can't just say nope and then move on. I reject H naught in favor of H A. So that's your, your second part of your conclusion, right? What's your conclusion in terms of the null hypothesis? But if you presented that to a client they would be one, really confused, and two, probably upset that they're even paying you because that doesn't mean anything, right? Our job is really just to present the conclusion in terms of the question. So what was the question? It was a long time ago. Do these data provide convincing evidence that the proportion of American Facebook users are comfortable with Facebook creating a list of interest categories for them is different than 50%. You just reword all that junk. I shouldn't call it junk, but it kind of feels like it at this point. We did the hard part. And I'm gonna do, do this. These data provide convincing evidence that the proportion of American Facebook users are comfortable with Facebook creating a list of interest categories for them is different than 50% period. It is, there is that, all that, which is your conclusion in terms of the question. I don't wanna write it all out, right? And so you just rephrase the question as a yes or no answer, right? There is or there isn't. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Let me just, uh, oh, the conditions. Oh, dang it. Okay. I know I only have mere minutes, but um, so that's the conclusion. It, hefty part of the work, right? And usually it's three out of seven marks for your conclusion. So that's the most important part, okay? And just before we finish, so the rest of the slides just kind of walk you through what we just did, but I think it's, it's better if we just do it together like we did. But for our conditions, it's introducing it in a way where we have to pick the one that's wrong, okay? But let's just talk about why it's all of these except for D, how about that? So in terms of our conditions, the respondents in the sample should be independent of each other with respect to whether or not they feel comfortable with their interest being categorized by Facebook. That should be true, right? Because independence and so is always a condition. We always assume that things are independent of each other, which means that sampling should have been done randomly, right? This is a, a follow-up to the independence. We also talked about the 10% condition before, 
So the sample size should be less than 10% of the population of all American Facebook users. 850 is definitely less than 10% of all American Facebook users. So that's safe, right? And it goes back to the independence condition, but this one is the one that it's not. There should be at least 30 respondents in the sample that doesn't go anywhere yet. And then there should be at least 10 expected successes and 10 expected failures is one of those conditions. Now for hypothesis testing, you're gonna check that P naught or N times P naught is greater than 10 and N times Q naught is greater than or equal to 10. Whereas before it was the number of observed successes and failures that you were checking. Down. And we'll pick that up. Let me just scroll here. No, we'll start chapter six, which is more of the same on Monday. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, see you on Monday. And I am out of time. Yeah, okay. Phew.